our featured presentation this morning. We are honored to have with us our new Aiken County Public School District Superintendent, Dr. Sean Alford. Dr. Alford received his undergraduate degree in education from the Citadel, where he played football, his master's in educational administration from the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee, and both his educational specialist and doctorate degrees in educational leadership from the University of South Carolina in Columbia. He started his career in the classroom teaching world and American history, psychology, and modern literature, and has spent the last two decades in administration with South Carolina's public schools. Most recently, as an assistant superintendent with the Dorchester County District outside of Charleston, and in Dorchester, where he directed instruction and technology for 22 schools with 25,000 students and more than 1,500 teachers and staff, the district saw double-digit gains in graduation rates under his leadership. Also in his previous role as Beaufort County's Chief Instructional Services Officer, seven schools achieved excellent report card ratings. None had received that top rating before his direction and supervision. Dr. Alford has been married to his wife Stephanie for 18 years, and her family includes six children. A proven leader with a great track record of success, we are proud to have him here with us in Aiken County. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Sean Alford. Good morning. morning. It is certainly my honor and pleasure to stand before you this morning. It has been an overwhelming experience, not just the transition, but the level of warmth, the hospitality, just the genuine outreach that I have received since beginning here in Aiken County. When you live in South Carolina, you expect warmth and hospitality. That's what we do. But it has just been a tremendous outpouring on behalf of the community here. And for that, I am truly grateful. I consider it not only an honor, but a privilege to serve this community in this capacity. As I begin, I want to make sure that as we spend a measure of your time giving you some insight on the school district's new leader, I want to focus on the fact that Aiken County School District has had great leadership over a long period of time. And we have a leadership team currently that is second to none, and that begins with our Board of Education. So. I want to make sure I take some time to recognize our board members, Mr. Levi Green, Mr. Wesley Hightower, the good captain, Cecil Ashley. Those are the only three that I actually saw this morning coming in. I don't want to miss anybody. You know you, you got a record. Don't miss anybody. <laughs> <laughs> but I also want the, the cabinet members in our uh, district office to stand and be recognized, please. If you would, please stand. If anything good happens for our students, for our family, for our community, it will be because of the team. It will be because of the team, and I, and I want to make sure that we establish those things as we begin. Our mission as a learning organization clearly puts the focus and the emphasis on creating a passion for learning as it relates to our students. It's student-driven, it's student-focused, but it also highlights the creation of passion for learning. We want students to be lifelong learners. But it certainly would be very easy to remove or redact the word student from that vision statement. Because we have a greater mission than that. We really strive to create a passion for learning in this community. It should move beyond the students we serve, K-12. We're establishing great partnerships. We're enhancing great partnerships with our post-secondary institutions, with our businesses, industry leaders, through adult education, providing opportunities for those who, again, want to pursue and enhance their skill set. So it's an overall 
creation of passion, not just for our students. I want to take a moment, though, because this is a learning opportunity, and as an educator, I want to share with you some of those things I believe are characteristics of great leadership. I believe great leaders model, but they set an example. They're willing to do the things they ask others to do. They're willing to approach tough issues in a particular way and with a wonderful disposition. Modeling, again, if we're going to create a passion for learning, what better way to do that than to model? I also believe that great leaders set the direction. They set a vision. Not only where we want to go in a collaborative sense, but also how we want to get there. Great leaders set the standard. There was a story that's told about the lacrosse coach at Duke University, and he has a set of non-negotiables for his team. One of those non-negotiables is a simple phrase, no palms up. No palms up. That's the standard that he sets for his team, for his coaches. And in his description of that phrase, no palms up, he says when, when individuals stand in this pose and they shrug their shoulders, it's really an admission of an excuse. They're looking for special favor. Why me? Why now? What's going on? Instead of palms up, he encourages his players, he encourages his coaches, take some initiative. Find a way to solve those problems. It's okay that you recognize a challenge, but then also you have to provide a possible re resolution or a proposed answer to those challenges. I believe also that great leaders help to establish a productive climate. I have a phrase, tough on process, easy on people. Tough on process, easy on people. In our school district, we strive to create a climate that is not only family friendly, but it's nurturing. It encourages every student and professional to strive toward their dreams. We can get you to do your job. We can help you understand what your job is and do it well. But we certainly don't have to beat you up to accomplish that goal. Great leaders seek alignment of resources. And many times, particularly in the public sector, we have to have the discipline to say no. We have to have the discipline to say no. Because many times we'll get a knock on the door with what appears to be a great idea. Not as many times there may be money attached or resources attached. But we have to ask ourselves, does this offer align to our vision? Does, does it align to our strategic plan? Sometimes we have to say no and have the discipline to say no as we seek that alignment. Last but not least, I believe great leaders are willing to confront the unexpected. Willing to confront the unexpected. No matter how great that strategic plan is, no matter how short or long your to-do list was when you left the house that morning, Guess what? It will probably change. We've traveled the community from corner to corner. And every once in a while, probably more often than that, people will pull me aside and say, how's it going? <laughs> how's it going? My response, the universal response has been, we are cautiously optimistic. <laughs> Cautiously optimistic. 
things have gone extre exceptionally well. The students are excited. Our teachers are excited. We've probably got another week or so before people start dreaming about the summer. <laughs> <laughs> We're cautiously optimistic. We are. It's, it's like when the, when the pilot comes over the intercom and says, we've reached our cruising altitude. You are free to roam about the cabins, but keep your seatbelt on. <laughs> keep your seatbelt on. Great leaders, I believe, are prepared to confront the unexpected because you never know when turbulence will arise. I just wanted to, as we started, share those six characteristics, uh, again, in this learning moment, because many of you lead organizations as well. And I think any time we have an opportunity to share as professionals, it certainly puts us in a position to grow. During transition, <laughs> There's anxiety most times, particularly when you're talking about transition of executive leadership. With those thoughts in mind, we wanted to proactively communicate to the community and to members of the school district exactly what we want to do in this 100 days. Will it relieve everyone's concerns? Probably not. But if you make a proactive effort to communicate with clarity and precision, it gives individuals an opportunity to at least investigate and have a greater level of understanding as it relates to what it is you want to accomplish. First and foremost, we are going to focus on the safety of our students. Parents send students to school, they send their children to school because they want them to learn. They want them to grow. But every parent, if you ask them, they will say, when I drop my child off at school, or when I put them on the bus, I want to be able to go to work. I want to be able to go about my daily tasks and not worry about the safety of my student. That comes before achievement, as far as we're concerned. So that's the first thing. We want to make sure students are safe. We want to make sure we provide for them a high quality educational experience. And we also want to make sure that we are earning and maintaining the trust of our community as it relates to our financial responsibility and the resources that have been shared with us. So, in this 100-day entry plan, we set forth what we felt would be clarifying goals in a proactive way so that the community would know the things we would be focusing on and striving towards during this initial period of transition. So now I'll lift the shade and give you a little peek of Sean Alford as a leader. I consider myself to be one of the most fortunate individuals in the world. Now that I'm an Aiken, I know I'm number one. <laughs> I grew up probably with the best parents in the world. We were poor, but I never knew it. I never knew it. They showered on my siblings and I a tremendous amount of care. They were great role models and they were advocates for each of us in our own special way. My mother was my very first teacher. She was an aide in a Head Start classroom she took me to Head Start at three to participate in the four-year-old class. <coughs> so I really got a Head Start. <laughs> three and four. But when I went to kindergarten, meet the teacher night, I can remember this, it's clear in my mind. She walked me in the room and she said, you sit right here. And I sat there and the teacher met parents and shook hands and my mother just stood on the side. And when the line died down, she walked up, she shook the teacher's hand, but she asked her to come to the table where I sat. And when she got there, she looked at the teacher and she said, this is my exceptional child. What are you gonna do to challenge my exceptional child? I'll never
never forget that. When my mother finished with her, <laughs> I only spent half the day in kindergarten. <laughs> the other half was in the first grade classroom. And that lift, that head start, that support, really gave me wings throughout my entire educational career. And I, I, I really appreciate that. I recognize that having that type of support, having that advocacy, puts me in that realm or that category of being extremely fortunate. Because as you look at the 25,000 plus students in Aiken County, it's sad to say, but true, many of those students don't have advocates like my mother. And I'm not going to place those in just categories of single parent homes. There are many homes where both parents are present and students still lack an advocate. So it's with that desire to give back, it's with that desire to pay it forward that I've chosen this wonderful, this wonderful field. I consider our work God's work. And since I'm in Aiken, I don't, I don't think I have to be ashamed to say that. <laughs> so. That's why I'm an educator and I'm an advocate for public schools. But there are a certain number of things that I believe, and we wanted to share these things outright. My very first meeting with our school leadership we put those things on the table because we want to make sure that as an organization, we can embrace these concepts. Now, I'm going to have a hard time. Somebody please give me a mic that I can carry because I can't be glued to this podium. So if I can have one, will this one go with me? No? Well, it's coming. I'll continue as it comes. We're going to guarantee a high educational, a high quality educational experience for every child. That's going to be challenging because we have a large organization. It is geographically large as well. But it is our duty, thank you so much ma'am. It is our duty to make sure that regardless of where you live, who your parents are, what your cognitive abilities may be, it is our responsibility to guarantee every child a high quality educational experience. Again, that's not easy because you have to have alignment in your organization. You have to have a similar expectation or a common standard. And we have to make sure that that is executed and delivered in every school site. But also, I believe that's the promise of public education. As a parent of six, I support any parent's decision to educate their child in any environment they deem most appropriate. So I have no qualms at all with private schools, charter schools, home schools, no problems at all. I'm a public school advocate because I firmly believe our democracy is grounded in an educated public. And if we fail in our mission, then our way of life may be challenged. So to begin, as an organization, we want to guarantee that high quality educational experience for every child. I'm going to give you five or ten seconds to read this one. The same individuals I ask to stand are directly responsible for making sure we provide high quality support to every school. Since we live in the great state of South Carolina, I can say it this way. 
we're not going to have have and have not schools. We're just not having it. If we're going to guarantee that high quality educational experience for every child, this can't happen. So it doesn't matter if you live in the city limits, within the county, Ridge Spring, doesn't matter. We are going to support every school. We are going to engage every community. Because again, that's our responsibility. And that's the promise of public education. Again, tough on process. Easy on people. I love to laugh. Honestly, I'll cut up a little bit. <laughs> but we want to have fun. We want to enjoy the work. But we certainly want to respect people. We want to encourage a strong value system. We won't shut the lights off at 5 o'clock and rush everybody out the building. We won't do that. But you know, if I come by your office, and our folks know that, if I come by your office a couple of days in a row, and you're there at 6.30, 7 o'clock, I'm going to ask you, when's the last time you had dinner with your family? You know what? That will be here when you get back tomorrow. Is there anything I can do to help you with that? If all those don't work, then I'll shut the lights off. <laughs> <laughs> it's time to go home. <laughs> you have to re-energize, folks. You have to keep the things that are important at the forefront. And if we're going to have a great community, we have got to have strong families. And if we're going to model and expect that in our students and our staff, then we have to model those things as leaders. Last but not least, there should be a consistent emphasis on literacy, numeracy, alignment, and also technological infusion. Students have to have technology skills. Digital literacy is, to me, a skill that is a necessity for the 21st century workplace. And we want to make sure that in everything we do, we're coming back and connecting to these four points. There's a movement in our state, and it's been so for the past three or four years, where public schools have really been challenged to sharpen our sword. So we've really had to ask ourselves some challenging questions. And working with the state committee those three years ago, we began to ask ourselves questions like this. How do we objectively determine if graduates are ready for post-secondary opportunities? I am quite sure we have always been proud of the value of a diploma from an Aiken County school. How do we define that value? Now, my wife told me not to ask this question, but I'm going to ask it. <laughs> Many of us here have a high school credential, a diploma. Now, I'm going to ask it. <laughs> Raise your hand if you took a calculus class in high school. My hand's not up. <laughs> Raise your hand if you took an AP class or a college-level class in high school? Is that everyone? It's not. There certainly denotes difference in skill sets and individuals' access to information, experiences, but most of us have a diploma. What does that diploma mean? How can we objectively define the fact that every graduate is ready for high quality post-secondary opportunities? In that committee of statewide leaders, 
It was a sad case, but the answer was we can't. Are we able to monitor the student's progress longitudinally over a period of years through any system? Moving back and forth through communities in the state, even within the same community, can we determine by a similar measure how students are progressing? We couldn't. This was probably the best question in my eyes. Communication. How are we helping or can parents and students and stakeholders really understand the level of preparation for every individual who fills out an application, seeks employment with your firm or your industry? Education needs is what we call it. And sometimes it's very, very hard, and we struggle as organizations, public schools, to communicate in ways that stakeholders could understand. That's critical if we're going to embrace our role, our responsibility, in workforce development. So what we will strive to do in Aiken County Public School District is to make sure that we are not only graduating students with diplomas, but we want to make sure that we're graduating students who have a sound set of employable skills and that we communicate that to our public in a way that is clearly understood. Because if we have clarity and precision in that communication, collaboration is encouraged, it's facilitated. We can establish common goals. We'll have a great understanding of what it is you want in a potential employee. Those things haven't happened in the past. As part of that entry plan, we set a goal out there where we really want to shift the paradigm in our, in our organization. We want to move from product-driven service to solution-driven service. The diploma is great. Actually, it's required by law, so yes, we will still issue and pursue diplomas. <laughs> but if we realize the meaning of the diploma really doesn't provide clarity, then there's some other things that we have to do. We teach. We're really good at that. But we have to make sure that we're providing not products or graduates with diplomas, but we're providing solutions to the community's needs. That's the idea that we want principals, like our outstanding principal back there, Jill Jett, we want those folks to understand that and push those ideas forward in their organization. It's not just about counting credits. It's about making sure Young people have the ability to feed their families, to earn a gainful wage, and make a contribution to our community. We will very soon, and I'm watching my clock, Dave, we're right on. <laughs> we will very soon share with the community the results of our first administration of an assessment we call ACT Work Keys. Raise your hand if you're familiar with Work Keys or the National Career Readiness Assessment. All right, that's your homework assignment. <laughs> you can't come to a school district presentation and not have a homework assignment. <laughs> Hopefully we'll have an opportunity to come back to a first Friday. This is an initiative that allows public schools to speak in a language that's clearly understood by business and industry. So not only will a potential em employee have a diploma and hopefully some sort of post-secondary credential to go with that, but they will also have an industry-certified endorsement 
that tells you particularly as a job creator what their specific level or skill set is. And it's our goal to make sure that every graduate has that portable work-based certificate. It's one of the great things that our governor did when she removed from us the responsibility from an exit exam and in place asked that we allow every student to participate and hopefully earn a portable work-based certificate. Again, it's an effort on, on, on the behalf of schools to communicate and prepare students for that 21st century workforce. <clears throat> I can't share now because the information is under embargo, but you will soon see the percentage of students in, in our school district who are current seniors who have already earned this certificate. It comes at four levels, platinum, gold, silver, bronze. You'll see the percentage of seniors who have already earned that certificate. We're going to report it and share it to you. In addition to our graduation rate, we're going to publicize a work ready rate. These students in our senior class are ready for work right now, according to your standard, not our standard. And we're excited about that. We want to be respectful of your time. If there's anything I want you to know as you leave today, we'll have an opportunity to share more about progress as it relates to student achievement. We'll have an opportunity to share more about our vision as it relates to our responsibility to support and facilitate workforce development in our community. Our main task right now is to make those 100 days. We'll continue to meet. We'll be out and about. Hopefully, we'll get an opportunity to intersect with you at some point so that you can give us feedback on the things we do well and the things with a little bit more focus and energy we can do much better. I consider it a privilege to be here. Thank you so much again for your warm hospitality. We look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you.